All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is what happens when you compete against Tom Brady, I guess. But we, gotta, we have a pretty full room. Uh, and we have a great panel. Uh, and let me just uh, get started by introducing them. We'll start uh, from this side. Uh, Tyler Cowan, Professor of Economics at George Mason University and General Director of their Mercatus Center. Uh, Sally Hubbard is the Senior Editor of the Capital Forum. Macon Del Rahim is the Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. And Luigi Zangales is Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. My name is David Faber. I'll be your moderator. Uh, for this uh, panel. We're going to take questions uh, about 45 minutes in as well, so I certainly look forward to hearing uh, from the audience. Um, I am a news guy, so I have to sort of start there, segregating this from the rest of our conversation making, but I can't not ask about a couple of things <laughs> given, given the changing news environment. First, not long before I walked in here, closing arguments going on. By the way, what are you doing here? There's closing arguments going on in, in your big case. We got great people litigating the stuff. They don't need me. Um, uh, apparently, in the way it was portrayed, at least in the Dow Jones headlines, was that the government had, uh, in the closing arguments, had said to the judge, you can do structural remedies if you decide not to block the deal. How should we view, how should we view that? Well, at the risk of saying things I shouldn't be saying, but it's public because Craig Conrath presented that in the closing argument. Um, and I mentioned it last week, you know, the Justice Department, we're not, it's not like private litigation just to win a case. If our competitive harm in that matter is resolved through other means, um, we've, the offer we had provided to AT&T was, you know, a, a lot of the evidence was the combination of the distribution, particularly in DirecTV and the Turner Networks. And so they could, they could allow the deal go through as long as the injunction is for the Turner assets. Uh, some were viewing it, though, as some sort of admission of, uh, of by the government that it did not think it would prevail. No. It's, well, we'll always see, right, uh, in a legal process. But uh, I don't think people who view it that way should, um, should view it that way. But it is, uh, it is, um, it is the same offer we had provided to AT&T uh, before we got into litigation. So a lot of these things get settled uh, in the past, and we're litigating this not to block. There might be some pro-competitive aspects of this merger, for example, the Warner Brother Library, and we'd be uh, perfectly fine if AT&T wanted to create you know, new innovative products using the HBO and Warner Brothers library. Uh, and again, and I'm, this will be it because I don't want to take time up from our important subject, but this morning, of course, or yesterday actually, uh, T-Mobile and Sprint announced their intent to, to merge. I interviewed both the, uh, the principals behind the deal this morning. Uh, they're yeah. making a lot of what they consider to be pro-competitive arguments. Do you have any, anything to share at all in terms of how you view four going to three in the wireless industry? I'm not the economist. You got a couple of economists, but uh, you know, I guess it's safe to say that the one thing we will be looking at is um, the output effects of this merger on magenta and yellow t-shirts and socks. <laughs> <laughs> he said he's going to show up, by the way, for all his meetings in his t-shirt and the whole thing. So it looks good on him. Yeah. It does. They've done a great job of competing in that market. They have. They brought prices down, which is a benefit, obviously, for consumers. Yeah. One would think it's a hard case for them to make. <laughs> this stuff is based on evidence and econometrics, as you know. So we have to take a look at all these. Uh, okay. I'll leave it there. Great. Maybe come Thank on you. CNBC and we can really <laughs> talk about this later. Um, but let's get to our subject at hand, which, of course, is sort of this larger issue of um, well, it's something we've been discussing more recently on, on my show in the morning um, in a way that we never had before, which I guess simply put is when we talk about Alphabet or we talk about Facebook or Amazon uh, and their power, are they becoming simply too large and too powerful in some way? And is there A, a measurement, uh, B, uh, uh, something that should be considered in terms of antitrust law? Uh, to mitigate that growing power. Um, and 
I'll, I'll just throw that out there for somebody who wants to take a shot at it. Sally, you want to start us off? Sure. So what I've been focusing on, I've been writing about the tech platforms and antitrust for about two years now. Um, I used to be an antitrust enforcer at the New York AG's office before turning into uh, being a writer. And about two years ago, I started to see a lot of conduct out of the tech platforms that really reminded me of the US v. Microsoft case. So uh, what I'm mostly concerned about with the tech platforms is that they are controlling the arena in which the game is played, and they are also playing the game. So the res result of that is that we have a playing field for competition that is quite distorted. <coughs> Uh, and what I've called this is uh, platform privilege, and that's the incentive and the ability of a platform to favor its own products and services over those of competitors. Competitors that are also depending on that platform once they become dominant and become the main way to be discovered by consumers, for example. So um, a lot of people think that the growth that the platforms have had has been just a result of being the best, but I've been tracking some anti-competitive conduct that I think very much mirrors the Microsoft case. Um, where they've Such been as? <laughs> well, I mean, the public ones that are already known about are what uh, Europe has been enforcing against, for example, the Google um, shopping case, the comparison shopping case, where it lev Google leveraged its market power as having 80% um, 80 per 80 of worldwide search market power to prioritize its own <coughs> comparison shopping service and put the comparison shopping services of its competitors on page four of the search results so no one could find them. So that's a perfect example of platform privilege. That's one that's public and known. There's a bunch more examples yeah. with Amazon, Apple, Facebook. but. I'll give someone else a chance to talk. Um, okay, well, yeah, feel free. Luigi, you, you, do you agree with, uh, with Sally on that basic assertion? Yes, but I would be a little bit more aggressive in the sense we need to understand that the platforms are different than the standard economics we all study in, in college or graduate school because they represent a, a two-sided platform. A two-sided platform is a situation where your value of belonging to the platform is determined by how many people that are on the other side. So uh, traditionally, uh, the first one that I, <laughs> at least I encounter was uh, uh, real estate brokers. Do you remember the time of the multiple listing service when they had a monopoly on the multiple li listing service? And uh, when the first time I bought an apartment, uh, they told me there is no cost for you having a real estate agent. It's free. Okay. Now, as an economist, you know there is nothing free. Somebody's paying for it. And uh, exactly what happens is that, of course, the seller is paying and indirectly you are paying through a higher price. And I think this is exactly what the platforms, uh, the digital platforms are about. You, we perceive that they are free, uh, but they're not free because uh, we pay for it through the advertising. And the advertising is charged uh, basically monopoly pricing because, uh, let's face it, the online advertising is 80, 85% controlled by two providers. Right, here we're talking Facebook and, and Alphabet, and we're not really yeah. talking as much about Amazon. Though yeah, it is a absolutely. Growing business and I think it's them. important to distinguish. I, I don't like the term uh, big tech because big tech uh, puts everybody in the same basket and does not focus on what is unique. What is unique is not the technology, what is unique is the fact they are. Uh, two-sided platforms and as such they need to be analyzed and as such they need to be understood so when we say that they are free every economist that say that this is service is free should lose his or her degree in economics because they're not free okay and it's like real estate agent, a, agent are not free and uh, and we pay for it we pay very dearly so the question is whether they do have market power, and if this market power is used in a way that is pro-competitive or anti-competitive. So do they have market power on the uh, advertising side? And I think the answer is yes, because uh, when you control, when two providers control more than 80% of the market, I think that uh, you have unique things. Now, this is additionally in increased by the fact that they use targeted ads. Targeted ads are worth three times as much as normal ads. This is th these are the market prices. Targeted ads can only be done by having certain kind of data. 
And a certain kind of data, you can only have them by be integrated in the way Google and Facebook are. So if I'm in the New York Times, I have a lot of valuable data, but they're not integrated by, by Google search data with all the other data. The only platform that have everything are basically Google and, and, uh, and Facebook, and Amazon is coming along the way, but I think others too. And those are uh, using this in targeted ads that are sort of uh, uh, useful to consumers, but also are priced at, uh, uh, at a premium. And that's what uh, the, the exploitation of market power is. Right. And also, uh, there is an entire issue about uh, uh, whether they use, once you know that they have some market power, then there is the question of uh, how they use it in a way that is disruptive not only to the economy, but also to democracy. Uh, we know that Google searches give a priority, and that priority is extremely important for people's decision. The stuff that uh, everything is a click away is rhetoric of Google with no foundation, because we know from experiments, well-conducted experiments, by Susan Eighty, who is like uh, a, one of the most important uh, economists, she won the Clark Medal, she shows that the difference between one being number one and number three in the ranking uh, reduce your hit by 50%. And number one, number 10, by 85, okay? This is in commercial choices. Then there are, there are indication of political choices. The ranking of the articles affect the way you vote. So this is an enormous amount of power that I'm not sure that Google has used yet, but just the threat of use. If I'm the government, do I really want to regulate Google when Google can make me lose the next election? Just the threat is enough to make me shy away. Really, you think that Google actually has the power to potentially intimidate politicians from legislating against it? Absolutely. First of all, you agree with that? <laughs> they, have, they certainly have some tools, but I, you know, I, I will agree with him that Professor Susan Athey is phenomenal at, at Stanford. And she is, uh, she was I great. She was one of our experts in the AT and T case. <laughs> I, I'd like to respond to a lot of the points on the table. First, almost all of you in this room use these services. Most of your use of them is free. You benefit greatly from this. You use them for a reason. T Tyler, you right? pay in other ways. It's not free. Look at I take online away your degree Luigi, in please, economics stop. if you say it's free. I Look agree, at online free. advertising. I use Facebook online advertising. I pay for it. It is much cheaper, much better, much higher quality, much better service than radio, TV, newspaper, many other options I have. It is not a monopoly. Facebook and Google have a lot of that market because they provide a better service at a lower price. And no, they did not elect Trump. So there's not evidence that is monopoly. U.S. antitrust policy is based on a standard of consumer harm. You have new options for advertising. In fact, Facebook advertising lowers the overall degree of monopoly in an economy because small and medium-sized businesses can reach the customers. These businesses could not afford, say, television and radio. So Facebook is the great engine of anti-monopoly. Facebook and Google have been highly innovative. The charge against Microsoft is that it wasn't. Most of all, if you look at consumer surplus, from those services and you ask, is there serious consumer harm? Not some anecdote you can pull out or what might they do or someone is going to be first in Google or Bing or third. That's not something we can fix by the law. Ask the basic questions. Are consumers much, much better off? Is this still a dynamic changing market? Do we really trust antitrust to figure out how to set this right and what's been the most dynamic creative destruction laden period of the last 10 to 15 years that we've seen in almost any sector ever, I think right now we still want to encourage market innovation. Um, let, me, let me focus on innovation for a yeah. moment if I can, because from my layman's uh, perspective here, how do you go about measuring, for example, whether what he said is true, that they have been incredibly innovative when you don't necessarily have a sense for what innovations haven't occurred as a result of their potential market power? I, th I think you know you you were touching on the most important point. I mean, first of all, uh, the linchpin of a free market economy is you want businesses want to innovate and have the ability to become monopolists. I mean, uh, so not in a. Uh, I'll explain what I mean no, by I that. Being big is not bad. 
Being big should never be bad under antitrust law or policy. Being big, behaving badly should be bad. And that's what Microsoft was doing 20 years ago. It, you want to encourage an environment where there are those innovators. You know, they're creating uh, output maximizing products such as the advertising for the small business person who may not be able to afford Chiat Day or somebody else to have a $50 million account, but be able to go off with a credit card and buy you know, 50 bucks of Facebook ads. However, that doesn't mean that once you're an innovator, you're now exempt from the antitrust laws. If you are uh, acting in a certain way that you are preventing entry and a threat to your uh, you know, the monopoly that you have earned. And you want folks to have that. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of my role in policy setting is to make sure that, that, that we don't interfere in that free market, but also make sure that right. companies don't interfere in that market through illegal acquisitions or illegal behavior. So, you know, the, the fundamental issue with Facebook, I mean, with Microsoft, was not the fact that they had, you know, 98% market share in the operating system. It was, they were now trying to block the only threat to that operating system, which was the browser developed by Mark Andreessen and others. Uh, which, what did that do? That threatened the monopoly that they had for the operating system because you now can create, you know, word processing and calendars and whatever, but you didn't have to write it to the operating system. You could now write it to the browser and any other operating system can read and function for that application. And that's what the DC Circuit, in a unanimous decision, found as problematic. And they said, just because you're an innovator does not mean you're exempt from the laws. That's what Microsoft was doing. And if there's evidence of you know, Google or Facebook or Amazon doing that type of activity, absolutely it should be a violation of the antitrust laws. I know, but Sally, how do we find the evidence? I guess, you know, uh, anecdotally, for example, I speak to a venture capitalist who says, I will not actually consider pitches from any company that will compete against Amazon, Alphabet, or Facebook in any main part of their business. Now, I don't know, is that, any, I mean, does that, is that an admission that they are too powerful? Or should that not be something that is measured in terms of trying to understand what innovations are not being allowed as a result of their dominance? I mean, that's not going to work in an antitrust case, but I think it is obviously very problematic when any company that is going to compete against, against these tech platforms, and these tech platforms, I mean, Amazon in particular is turning into an octopus, right? Almost any industry that you're going to enter, there's going to be a big tech company competing against you. So when the VCs aren't funding you, that is an indicator that something is wrong. But I think we can look at actual anti-competitive conduct. I mean, I mentioned the Google Shopping case. The Google Android case that EU is also pursuing is so similar to the Microsoft case. We have similar conduct with Amazon where it's prioritizing its own products and services, or its own products on its um, platform and using everybody else as a petri dish to see what sells, making it itself and giving itself first rank in the uh, search results. There's a lot of conduct that very much mirrors kind of what was at issue in Microsoft. So I think we can look at you know, the actual standards we have rather than um, those atmospherics, although obviously that's very troubling. You can buy from a remarkable number of third-party sellers on Amazon, and consistently in just about every market, Amazon means lower prices, better delivery, pretty good customer service. Where is the consumer harm? Well, How many of you out here are prime? What is it you think you're paying for? The issue with Amazon is, this is where I think we've gone astray, right? As a consumer, if you only care about low prices, you are going to miss Amazon's antitrust problems. And uh, there's a brilliant article by Lena Khan about this called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox. And actually, if you look at the antitrust statutes, they don't say anything about low prices. They talk about competition, okay? I understand that low prices is one way of measuring competition, but is not the end-all, be-all of antitrust. To me, antitrust is about competition. Prices is one way to measure that. If you have a company that can observe any other manufacturer on the platform and say, oh, that product is selling well, I'm going to make it myself, then I'm going to put myself, uh, make it an Amazon basic, make it the first search result. Uh, I'm going to give myself the buy box, which, b by the way, means I get 90% of sales once I have the buy box. And by the way, Amazon accounts for one out of $2 spent online. I think you have a competition problem. 
And you know, if you're single-mindedly focusing on just, well, is it low prices for consumers, we can look back at what, was the, what happened with Walmart. I don't well, think look, we want to repeat that. Look at diversity of choice. Has that gone up or down from Amazon? It's clearly gone up. No one in this room would suggest the contrary. I think that there's a lot of problems with Amazon deciding when it wants to have a monopoly of any product. And I've talked to sellers, third-party sellers, who tell me that um, when they're selling a product, as soon as it's doing well, if they find out that Amazon is selling it itself, they liquidate their inventory entirely. And Amazon actually has used the pressure of low prices to c force brands to come online and sell to them directly, promising that they'll keep the prices in check. There's actually, a, I've written about this, a risk of a, there's a, a, a price fixing situation that's happening with Amazon saying to brands, oh, sorry that there's a lot of um, low pricing on our platform. We can't fix it uh, unless you want to sell to us directly then we will uh, make sure that you can approve all the sellers and make sure that there's only sellers that adhere to map pricing. So, you know, there are a lot of anti-competitive practices that are happening, and if you're only obsessed with, you know, one aspect of what it means to be a consumer, the low prices, then you're, I think, going to miss out on a lot of the content. Luigi, about. let me get you in here. In I think that this is the danger of putting all together in the same basket. I think that each case should be analyzed separately because the cases are different. So let's start with uh, Google, for example. I think that uh, uh, the Assistant Attorney General said perfectly, we should not penalize who succeed and becomes big by being more efficient. Uh, we should promote innovation. But we should remember that yesterday's innovators are today's monopolists who block new entry and competition. Microsoft was greatly innovative. Uh, people of my generation remember what it meant to have the first DOS system, the first Windows, uh, the benefit of it. All the stuff that Tyler is saying now about Google, we could say about uh, Microsoft back then. And the problem was not what they did in the past, is what they were about to do in the future. In uh, yesterday's startup are becoming today's aggressive monopoly that stop innovation. Microsoft stop innovation. And if today we have Google and Facebook, it's thanks to the antitrust investigation. And even if the remedy was very small, I think that the trial was rem remedy because that made us care of abusing their market position. That's the reason why we should go after Google today because we don't need to go uh, at, at search. There is evidence. The FTC was leaked out. The FTC, our own FTC, did an investigation and found there was evidence of abuse in market power. Now, why the commission voted five to nothing to not proceed? And then you have to ask the question, how much overlap there were between Google employees and the Obama administration? Uh, how many people have uh, received job before and after from Google? <laughs> and then you are, uh, answer, and by the way, who helped Obama get elected was partly Eric Schmidt and his own company helping Obama. Okay, so now we're all focusing about Trump, but the problem is much bigger than that because if something is done by Trump, is evil. If it's done by Obama, is cool. He uh, uses technology. I think that the problem is the same. Doesn't matter whether you're left or right. The problem is the democratic problem, and I think that Google is in the middle of it. Okay, and has innovated a lot. I love Google. I Google everywhere, and I think that is is very important. And now there's been some estimates about consumer surplus generated by Google. Uh, great. Okay, that's not what we should look at. We should look at in the future. Does this favor? innovation or not. And the fact that they try to preempt anybody that competes with them, the fact that they are the infrastructure that allows people to look for a place and they are competing in the same place, is there are two sides. And of course, they bias and the evidence from the FTC investigation and the European Commission say they do use that power to bias the, the search. And I think that is the problem. That's where they pre preempt innovation. And uh, it's very simple. To begin with, why, why do they need to own YouTube? It's very easy to break up YouTube from Google. Okay? Like it's very easy to break up so Instagram from Facebook and WhatsApp. Very easy. I think it was a mistake to let them merge. And I think it's very easy to break them up. Well, they were very small companies, when, or relatively small companies, when they were bought by Facebook. Certainly Instagram was uh, nowhere near the dominance. There could be arguments now. that 
without the efficiencies that a Google brought to YouTube, YouTube wouldn't be what it is today or what Facebook did with Instagram. Instagram wouldn't be as useful as it is. I mean, largely they did that to try to compete right, with Snapchat. But then, then so there are, YouTube yeah. was a wreck. You had to buffer videos and you'd wait, you'd wait, it would yeah. drop off. Google fixed that, Google put in money, Google has helped develop driverless cars, Google Glass doesn't work yet, something like it will work. There's, it's hard to find a company that has innovated more than Google, and there's sort of one particular margin where you're not happy with what Google has done, and you're saying they're hostile to innovation. No, they're very, they're great, and they're gonna develop uh, you know, AI to the extent that we're all gonna be uh, slaves of robots in the not too distant future, <laughs> but uh, I guess that's a panel for somewhere else. Um, you need Franklin Four on that panel. Yeah. Um, on, on Google uh, and what yeah. Luigi was saying, do you have the tools available to you now? Should you actually agree with his viewpoint to do what you would need to do? Or how does the decision making even go mm. about whether to bring a case or whether you would bring one even with the idea that you might lose simply because doing so would be a powerful statement? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, first of all, Congress has not empowered us to look at anything beyond competition. So the democratic effects and other issues uh, you know, may be valid, but it's not a policy consideration uh, necessarily for us. But as far as the tools, I do believe that the antitrust laws um, and how they have developed um, do provide us with the tools to test it. Uh, do we have challenges with respect to predatory pricing and some of the concerns raised uh, in Amazon uh, and have an analytical framework where the Supreme Court has basically said, if you price below a, a certain marginal cost, uh, you have to have the ability to recoup those costs, otherwise consumers benefit. And if you're in a market where you may not be, you know, you're not charging anything, there's not really a recoupment element, uh, but you might be recouping in other forms, you need to have an anal analytical framework, especially when you're going after monopolistic practices as opposed to concerted action when there's folks have colluded uh, amongst each other. So we just have to be more careful uh, than just going after them. As far as you know, bringing a case just because it would regulate behavior, um, I, I would have to find a, a violation of the law before we would bring a case. And there needs to be, I think, both the evidence to win in court. Remember, we have the burden of proof to go into a judge uh, and proving that the parties have violated the law. And we can't just willy-nilly go to court and say, hey, I think this would be a good idea because people will behave better. Do you read the president's tweets involving Amazon? I don't know if, I probably have read reports about those tweets, <laughs> but there I don't been, know if I have read. There have been quite a few of them. More or less <laughs> oh, the same yeah. theme. Um, you don't read them. I, you know, I've read reports of tweets, but there's a lot of tweets. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts? I have other, other things. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, my thoughts are the same way. I look at it through the same prism of, uh, of antitrust law, looking at the, making sure we have the, you know, the proper econom econometrics and the proper evidence to bring a case like that. Um, and that's not to say any of these companies just because they're innovative are immune from the antitrust laws. But if there is credible evidence, um, I'd encourage people to bring it to the Justice Department. Well, you, you gave a speech a couple of weeks ago at the University of Chicago. You sort of talked about data as a new market asset, mm -hmm. also in terms of how people value privacy and, and that trade-off. Um, how do you view data right now as an asset class or an emerging asset class and one that, again, given the preponderance of data that is contained in these, let's call it these three companies, becomes anti-competitive. So data is obviously a powerful asset. And it's, I view it largely, uh, if you have been collecting data, um, it is your property. It, if it helps you improve your product, whether it's a search result or a delivery, uh, it is a product that if you have spent the money, the investments, the tools, to gather that data that's your asset. Uh, it is valuable. And what I was talking about in my speech was Professor Samuelson's, you know, uh, the subject of his Nobel Prize, talking about uh, the revealed preferences, where some of us, given the congressional attention and other attention to Facebook and the data there, um, a lot of consumers may be waking up and trying to say, wait a minute, maybe I'll value my privacy a little bit more. 
Um, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, my wife is, spends an inordinate amount of productive time <laughs> on Facebook. But uh, there's certain reasons I have chosen not to. I think the rise of Snapchat was a perfect example of folks who wanted to value a little bit of privacy because it was at least marketed as um, you know, vanishing in 24 hours. So I, I could see a market out there, and you know, Sheryl Sandberg has been talking about that, that, hey, would you be willing to pay you know, a certain amount for a subscription where we don't share your data? I would bet there's a, a, a decent amount of consumers who would be willing to pay for their data not to be shared and, and forego using a product. Um, some of these things, you know, if you care about your privacy, are a little scary. And I don't think there's uh, any of these companies, uh, anybody, any consumer, should be fooled into thinking that the data and, or any of these products are actually free. They're, you're exchanging something. Right. And, and, to, and the, to the extent consumers begin valuing their own privacy, you'll see a new market being created for privacy and your data as an asset. Do you think the Europeans are far ahead of us in terms of their understanding of or dealing with this issue? Uh, well, they're, they're far ahead of us in regulating this issue, absolutely. But I don't know if they're far ahead of us in understanding it any better. Uh, sometimes when you're forcing sh data to be shared by companies, you know, if, if Congress passed a law and said, you know, company X, you must provide access to your competitor into this database that you have because we'll create better competition. Um, there might be other policies to do so, but to me, that's like compulsory licensing of intellectual property or other properties where government comes in and says, you know, hand this over to me. I don't know if that's wise, but we should have a, a real debate so consumers really understand what is happening with their data. Um, and I think one of, the, you know, one of the technologies that might be coming where some of these issues would become even more important is search by voice, you know, where you have more Alexas in homes and in your cars and uh, what's the Apple product called? Apple Pod or whatever. And uh, Google is getting one. So there's competition to who wins that. Now, once you ask uh, you know, Alexa, where is the closest pizza restaurant? You know, it's, Alexa is only going to hand you over one. It's not going to hand you over 10 pages of 100 search results. And how important is that going to be? That's going to be a much more powerful product and the analysis is going to be important. Are they, is Amazon only going to direct it to their own product in that type of search? Should that be a violation of the antitrust laws? Or is that just innovation that maybe somebody else could compete to provide? I don't know the answers, but I think that's going to be even more important than a search result you know, on a page. I want to get everyone involved. Sally, do you, have, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I also want to get to your recent, uh, fairly recent uh, article on or paper on fake news and real antitrust problems, but do you want to respond here? Um, I know I agree the um, voice search is going to be a big problem with what I was talking about platform privilege and you see actually there's been some testing done and Amazon is already recommending, um, Alexa is already recommending Amazon batteries when you say Alexa give me batteries. So I do think that's going to be a big problem that uh, enforcers are going to have to watch out for. Luigi, I know you. <coughs> Megan said, said many important things, but uh, one of the most important ones was the issue about the data and the property of the data. So uh, all of you now give for granted the fact that uh, your mobile number is portable. You can move from Verizon to AT&T without any problem. Okay? Now, the number was created by the company. And uh, in the old days, I'm old enough to remember a time where you couldn't do that. Uh, that was regulation. Uh, of course, the company a scream expropriation, but uh, I have the econometric evidence to show you that across country, this is one of the main factors that bring competition in the mobile sector and uh, brings lower prices and no worse quality or investment, if anything, better. And by the way, this is also true in reverse for the four to three Merger. So in case you need, I give you the chromatic <laughs> evidence to show that, that this is a disaster for the U.S. consumers. So it's going to be a tax much bigger than any tax cut that you receive from the, from the Trump administration. This would be the phone tax bill created by this merger. So I so guess I you're, you're not in favor of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but going to the data, so like the number portability, we might have seen as 
a expropriation, but in fact was a tool of competition. The data portability of uh, introduced by the European Union are a powerful tool for competition. Because it is true that a company has accumulated those data, but then at the end of the day, those are your data. And if you want to share with somebody else, why not? So why we make uh, the number of your phone portable, but not your bank account portable? If I want to move from Citibank to Bank of America, I have to transfer all the checks and the, the credit card. It's a nightmare. Why can't we have in the same way in which you have a change in the number of the phone? You call the new company and say, please transfer me. Within two hours, that's transfer. This is doable. That's what the European Union is doing it. That's what we need to do in America to have a more competitive sector. And what about the data? If I, my transaction data, of course, belongs to the company that accumulated, the bank that accumulated, but they also belong to me. And if I want to share the data promptly to the ne next bank I'm going to ask a, a, a credit from, I should be able to do it fast and efficiently. And that increases competition. So I think that that's what the antitrust should do. That's what the regulation should do to promote competition also in the United States. The banks have access to all of that through your credit reports anyways. Uh, actually, no, it's, not, it's not true. They don't know, for example, the frequency in which I pay. Suppose that I pay two days before or, or, or just at the last minute. Uh, the viability of my income. In, we, there is an entire literature in, in banking that say that there is a monopoly of information that leads to some specialty of banking. All this monopoly information in the past was not transferable because that was soft information that the teller had and was difficult to share. Today is shareable and by sharing it you increase competition. Don't we want to increase competition in the banking sector? Absolutely. And that's what we should do. The biggest threat to internet competition right now, people don't like hearing this, but it is European privacy law. The major companies will cope with it. They don't want to incur those costs, but they are able to. It is the smaller companies, the potential upstarts, the up-and-coming competitors who will be hampered the most by European privacy law. And the people who criticize big tech, they have two views, directly contradictory, like, oh, there are big, terrible monopolies, and then we need to impose costs on everyone in the sector. Those new laws will create a regulatory moat that will cement in a market dominance for Facebook and Google. Now on data portability, the biggest enemies of data portability are the critics of big tech. You take Mark Zuckerberg, you bring him before the Senate and the House, and you excoriate him on national TV for quote unquote data leaking out where there were some real abuses. The new incentive now is for things to be much more of a walled garden, not to give away any data, not to let it leak out. Data portability as an idea, whether or not you think it would work, I actually don't. But it is now dead because of the investigation into Facebook. Companies want to hoard their data. Who can blame them? Can Sally? I respond? Yeah, of course. A couple things. Um, <clears throat> data portability is definitely not dead. Rep Representative Cicilline wrote an op-ed in Wired <laughs> last week proposing both data portability and um, interoperability as well. So allowing, there's the option of taking away your data, but there's also the option of allowing Facebook to communicate with a different social network, just like I could send you an email from a Gmail account to an Outlook account. Allowing in, um, interoperability is another regulatory fix uh, to allow competition, promote competition in social networks. But this argument about the GDPR is just going to be bad for the little guys is something I don't buy at all. I've been writing about the GDPR for about a year now. Um, it is not the, the purpose of it. The European privacy regulation. Yeah, sorry, sorry, that's a general <laughs> Thank data. Thank you for doing sorry. what I should have done. <laughs> sorry, that's a general data protection regulation. Got a future that, in broadcast. <laughs> that, that is going into effect on uh, May 25th in uh, Europe. And, um, the recent argument that we've been hearing a lot of people making, including, including Zuckerberg, <coughs> is, oh, we're just so worried about the little guys and how this regulation is going to hurt them. I'm always skeptical when a company gives me an argument that doesn't actually affect their own economic <laughs> interest. Um, this is the only argument that they can make because it's like they have no better argument. Um, 
And the GDPR is, uh, you know, saying that the data belongs to the citizen. That it's a, I mean, there already is um, laws in the in the Constitution of the EU that say it's a fundamental privacy is a fundamental human right. And it is a big risk to Facebook and Google because the source of their dominance in digital advertising is their ability to track users across the web and their 360 degree view of user activity and their ability to combine that data with the data that they buy from data brokers and all the other, you know, they're, they're combining a lot of different data sets so they know more about you than, than like say NewYorkTimes.com could possibly know because it only gets your data when it goes to NewYorkTimes.com. So I had um, Jason Kent, who's the um, head of the Digital Content Next Trade Association that represents publishers um, at a panel that I was moderating, and he was saying the source of their dominance is this 360 degree view. Once you take away the 360 degree view, which the GDPR is going to do because it's going to make consumers give affirmative consent to agree to be tracked around across the web, you're going to level the playing field for competition in digital advertising a lot better and you're going to stop users from being tracked. I do not, there's also been studies that show users do not expect Facebook to be tracking them across the web. Users do not expect Facebook to be combining what they bought at the grocery store uh, with their online data. I had a friend who uh, bought some <coughs> coconut flavored ice cream. She's a yoga enthusiast, never eats ice cream. <laughs> she was talking about it with um, her husband, that she had bought it the next day in her Facebook news feed was that coconut flavored ice cream in her advertisement for the exact brand, exact flavor ice cream. And she was freaked out and she said, is Facebook listening to me? And I said, no, they're probably just, did you use a store loyalty card to buy that ice cream? They probably combined it with that. Yeah, there's they, no, they use a lot of the data yeah, brokerage. Yeah, so all I'm saying too. is there's not, um, the user expectations Users do not understand how they're being tracked. GDPR is going to do that. It's going to hurt Facebook and Google more than anyone else. Macon, I'm curious as to where you come down. We heard two very different views. I, you know, look, based on my uh, private practice and all of that, I do believe that regulatory compliance costs becomes a huge competitive benefit to incumbents and monopolists. They use that and, you know, you have regulatory capture. Any, you look at any industry whether it's the FCC or FDA or wherever it is, uh, the main incumbents use that process to be able for competitive uh, purposes. You know, whether it's a new generic drug coming in and you try to manipulate the food and drug laws and then Congress will have to go and change those. My former boss, Orrin Hatch, had passed you know, probably the most sweeping and important law, Hatch-Waxman. And then that process got abused through uh, a lot play. of processes. Yeah, yeah and I, well, and you know, from an antitrust law, I don't think that's that should be an antitrust violation. Well, the FTC pay -pay. did make. Yeah, the FTC, the FTC took FTC, it, and the yeah. Supreme Court, you know, uh, you know, kind of had a probably a proper ruling, and that didn't didn't buy FTC's ruling, but they thought it was you know those types of settlements should be by. But that was a problem with the law, and Congress had to go in and fix it a couple of times. But only the incumbents have the power, the financial resources, to use that process for competitive. Uh, for a competitive purpose. So there is, uh, I think what Tyler was saying, there's definitely truth to that. Once you create all these new regulatory systems, which all sound simple, easy, and are often wrong, uh, you actually create and perpetuate the monopolistic problem. When you have to go to that, that means the market has failed. And that means either antitrust didn't get in early enough, or there's other problems with the system where you're trying to address a different issue of democracy or thinking. Um, can, I, can I just say one thing? Yeah, sentence? I want to get to questions, so okay. think about them, and so, we'll get quickly if you can, so we'll one, get to the audience. The, just one response to that. If it was really going to entrench Facebook, why would they be advocating against it? Yeah, Good that, public that, relations. That was, no, no, that was exactly my point. And it's just you believe in revealed preferences. So let's look at revealed preferences by uh, the regulated. If that was a great thing, they would have pushed it. They would have asked to be imported from, the, from uh, Europe, and they're not. And so I, in principle, does regulation create bias to entry? Absolutely. That's George Stigler's idea and is very much true. 
Uh, does all regulation the same way create the same bias? No. no. This one is regulation that uh, clearly the incumbents don't want. Unlike sort of, uh, uh, I'm from finance, unlike Dodd-Frank, where the existing banks are very happy that Dodd-Frank is still there. And uh, my prediction is there would not be, in spite of the Trump's effort, there will not be a serious overruling of Dodd-Frank because the big banks do want this version of Dodd-Frank to survive. Okay. Ask, the small web, <clears throat> ask the small website providers what they want, and they will tell you very strongly, it is a disaster. I challenge any one of you here, set up a small to medium-sized website, and just try to calculate how long it would take you to even tell if your website is GDPR compliant, much less fix it. I actually run such a website. I am going through this right now myself, and I will tell you, this is a disaster waiting to happen that the American people are not aware of, that the EU is, in essence, imposing its law on all of our small to medium-sized websites. Yeah, but I, Tyler, you, you are a libertarian. Aren't you afraid of an organization that mm. own, uh, owns so much information about you? If that was the government, you would scream murder. It and, is and the, and the government the gov also. <laughs> what? No, no, it, I'm it, talking about the United the States. About, forget, in, in Europe, the reason why in Europe they're ahead is not because there's so much intercompetition is also because they have a tragic experience of dictatorship that is still in memories of living people. Okay? The, the same and, European and I think Union has no problems going to our national intelligence and getting that same data from us when they want it. The, the These are American the companies. They're viewed as a source of additional revenue. They are being coerced right now to pay more. This is part of a general strategy to extract more revenue from them. Europeans view the tech companies as not creating that many whether, jobs in whether Europe. Whether the motives is right or wrong, let's look at the outcome. I'm concerned about concentration of information in one hand, whether this is the government or is the private sector. And I think we have that concentration. This concentration is, uh, this concentration is going to become even bigger because with facial recognition, uh, they're going to know where we are in every moment, every place. And I think that this is the big brother. And I am honestly afraid whether this big brother is the government or is a private company is still a bad thing. And I'm surprised that you as a libertarian are not afraid. Um, OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's get some questions from the audience if we have them. I did see a hand. There's one in the back there. You, you went up first. Yep. <clears throat> Given all the bad press that Facebook and Google specifically have been getting lately, couldn't some innovative coders come up with a new company just to do it slightly differently that the customer would want, whether you know, we won't weight the searches in a certain way or we won't collect your data for a social networking company? I know going from zero to whatever Facebook is now is pretty Over tough. Billion, but, yeah. Right. But uh, do you think there's room for that at some point down the line? Who wants to take a shot at that? I'm happy to do that. Uh, first of all, there is DuckDuckGo, a new sort of a search engine that tries to do exactly what you're describing. But this is where it's important to understand the bias to entry and the nature of uh, two-sided platforms that uh, create a disadvantage for competition. So in the Google side, the most important thing is that uh, you, you become better. There are huge economies of scale. You become better the more searches you do. Okay, which is a reason why you don't want to break up Google per se, because there are huge efficiency in, in this search. But that also makes it very difficult for somebody else to compete. In the case of uh, Facebook, the major issue is you want to be where your friends are. Okay? So there are huge networks and not here. Now, this can easily be bypassed with some uh, social graph portability. But today, Facebook is fighting very aggressively. So just to give you a sense, if I give you my login and password for Facebook, and you access with my permission my Facebook page, and you get with my permission some data, you commit a federal crime, hacking. You could go to jail for this. Why? Because Facebook said so. That's a way to make it difficult to have what is called in jargon multi-homing, so the possibility of using multiple platforms at the same time. This is the interoperability she was talking about. With that, you can have competition. That's the reason why it's important to favor it, because new and better alternative will come along. If I come with a new alternative, but nobody's there, nobody knows about this, and, and I, I can't succeed. If you authorized them, it wouldn't be a violation of the law. No, even if you authorize it. 
Uh, th that's my understanding. There is a case uh, in front of the actually Supreme Court rejected it, but uh, went up to the Supreme Court. I think it's Power Ventures uh, in uh, in California. They started. They went up because they were trying exactly to disintermediate Facebook and mm -hmm. getting data with the permission of uh, of uh, uh, the users from different platforms and favor multi-homing. Interesting. Um, let's get another question here. We got a, a lawmaker in the room, Congressman. In the, in the age, let's bring you the mic, Ken. In, in this information age, and when we think about net neutrality regulations, and whether you're for them or against them, are Facebook and Google common carriers in the information age? You think about paid prioritization, you talked about rankings, the enormous power there, and how should they be regulated in, and versus the ISPs? This is a lawyer's question, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an economic um, one, too. I think that, um, you know, if we're going to give up on competition, um, then you're going to have to go that route and regulate uh, Facebook and Google like utilities. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. If you can do data portability, get, open up some competition, um, on, on Google search, it's very hard. I had actually um, the creator of JavaScript tell me that search has an insurmountable technical advantage. Um, I think the only threat technical threat to Google search is going to be voice search, actually, when, when, when we start to move toward voice. But um, if we're not going to, if we're going to say we, competition is not possible or we're not going to take actions to open up competition, then you necessarily get to this point of utility regulation. And then you could have, um, you know, equal access, non-discrimination, which is actually the remedy that the Google uh, European Commission I mean, that the European Commission put in in the Google Shopping case was equal treatment remedy, which is really a utility common carrier style remedy, is equal access. Um, the other main way that usually we regulate utilities is through um, rate regulation. People think it's difficult to do when you're talking about these free platforms, but as we've said, it's not actually free. You're paying with your data, your time, your attention, advertising. So um, there could be some regulations going to uh, the data that, that you're given, that, you know, the amount of data that these platforms are allowed to collect, if that's the way that we're paying, right? So I do think they're two sides of the same coin. I would prefer as an antitrust, former antitrust enforcer that we just open up competition. But if people say this is, these are natural monopolies and are gonna ignore the actual anti-competitive conduct that's happening and not take antitrust enforcement or regulatory measures to open up competition, then you're gonna end up with a common carrier like, rule. So, uh, you know, I, th I think, I hope we think hard um, as lawmakers before you subject, I think, private businesses to that type of uh, regulation and look back to see, you know, how has it been successful? Because, uh, you know, yes, competition is good, but I think the antitrust laws and, and our economy should be in favor of what I would call dynamic competition rather than static competition. Static competition being, let's take a snapshot, can we have greater competition and lower prices by 10, 10% today? Uh, yes, there's all sorts of things we can do to do that. Um, is that wise? No, because if it's at the cost of the next paradigm shifting innovation that comes along, uh, that would be, I think that would be uh, harming the consumer ultimately and harming investment. We do not want to kill. We want to do exactly what that gentleman who had asked back there is encourage an environment who comes in you know, with the VCs and others to invest in a new product. Um, we're seeing it because the business models haven't completely gelled. I mean, obviously in Google and Facebook, you have it, but if you have a new Facebook that is subscription-based and whatever percentage of the consumers on that would rather it be private and only share with, you know, their network, let's test it out. Let's see if the market would actually allow for something. We're seeing this in restaurant reservations. You know, there's open table, a lot of people are familiar with that. There is, uh, you know, there's multiple uh, products that have been testing different models. Do you charge the restaurant owner, you know, a dollar per reservation? Do you charge the consumer a dollar? Do you allow the consumer to have a secondary market for that reservation and sell it to another consumer to take that spot? Uh, there's, you know, there's Resi, there's there Talk, are, but there I mean, are a you could make an argument that Open Table is nowhere near as dominant in its market as Facebook is in what it does. I think uh, their competitors might the argue against that because they see, they, they believe there's enough restaurants. But the important part is in that, in it, for that market, 
there is competition and different models still live going on and competing. And it begs the question, is the consumer data uh, the product and the customer is actually the restaurant owner? So even though it's free to the consumer, um, is that really, is, should that be the economic measure or, is it, or should the economic measure be the harm to the person who's actually doing it, which is that restaurant owner in Manhattan or wherever? Um, we have time for one more question. We have a lot of hands up. Uh, that, actually, that gentleman there who, yeah, because you raised your hand earlier. I, I guess the question I was going to ask is if you all seem to think that data is property and is owned partially by the consumer at least and there are data rights around it, why not have an explicit, more formal transfer of that ownership right? Meaning it, it, if you had a real opt-in mechanism, not click on this box at the end of an 82-page disclaimer that the average consumer will never read and never understand, but actually understand what you're giving up and in exchange for what, you could then have Facebook go the way of Spotify. You could have a free version if you give me your data. You could charge me a monthly fee if I choose to keep my data and get it. In, in fact, if I don't even consume that much data, maybe the world evolves into where Facebook pays me to use them on a monthly basis because my data is worth more than the service I'm getting from them. But it seems like if you had a easy to understand, sensible transfer of that property right, uh, it, 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 the market would look a lot different because the reality of the matter is most people are transferring that property right without really an understanding of what they're doing. I think that's an, that's an important policy question that has, obviously it weighs on the competition issue, but really more of an issue for Congressman Walton and other and his colleagues to debate and consider. Uh, there's precedent for that. 1974, a lot of us uh, have to sign you know, uh, either yourselves or your kids, the, um, the disclaimers for students to, for their professors to write letters of recommendation. One of the greatest amendments that kind of was a rider to an appropriations bill by Jim Buckley of, you know, the former senator from New York and a phenomenal judge, uh, a former boss of mine. But uh, he, as a libertarian, put that in and said the students should own that because schools, high schools and colleges were exchanging information about the student without any ability of that student to see what was derogatory, to correct it or not. Now that's why you sign over that consent to allow your professor to recommend and that was a transfer of that ownership in one fell swoop and I think that's perfectly um, a legitimate policy debate to, to have. So I'm glad you think that the, this was not expropriation of property of the university, and I think it should be applied also to the big tech giants. Well, that was going forward, absolutely. But th you know, there was a lot of harm uh, in erroneous information about a student that was being transferred, and you should, at a minimum, have a right to correct that. Uh, but I think that makes um, a, good a lot of sense. But, but not if a whole investment and business model has been set up. I think there should be rules that are clear going forward. And perhaps that is something that can be done because God knows what kind of information gets passed on between businesses, housing decisions, credit decisions could be made on erroneous information. Uh, well, we're going to stay on time uh, and so we're going to stop there. It's been a very insightful discussion on obviously a challenging issue and one we'll continue to discuss. Thank you to all our panelists. Thanks to the audience. <laughs>